you know, realistically, I think you still need to take the same way I did. It's definitely things like that. I definitely hope I can do when I stop racing, finish my own career, try to help other young generation to be easier reach or get closer to their dream. But at the, at, at the time right now, I think uh, they still need to go, go abroad, race at the most competitive championship. And that's how you can get an eye from uh, Formula One. Welcome everybody to this week's F1 Beyond the Grid. My guest, Joe Granu. Joe, lovely to see you again. It's been two years since you were last on the show. Yeah, actually, I remember last time we did that in Montreux, I think if it was right. But yeah, it's, uh, things been changed over the two years. Quite a lot has Many changed. things changed. Wait, but, uh, can, can I just clear something up in terms of what has changed or hasn't changed? Can I mean, you take your hat off and reveal whether there is a mullet or not? <laughs> No, there's not a mullet yet, and it will never be one. <laughs> I thought I saw the team post. Oh, hang on. That was a fake that was first mullet that uh, I put okay. it on for my special helmet for Valtteri. <laughs> so, yeah, because I obviously Australia Grand Prix, I want to do Australia Aussie things. And then I was like, okay, I took that picture last year, 2000, or 2023, in the engineer office of Valtteri with his mullet, that's where, when he first introduced this very aggressive hairstyle. So I was like, okay, I put that picture originally took by myself on the helmet then, here we go. Have you been tempted to follow him? Uh, no, not really, not in that kind of areas, so of course. <laughs> I, what about the s the skimpy swimming trunks? No, not that. No, I can't. I can't do these either. Like, uh, yeah, I'm sure s many of you see a lot of my own. I don't know, like sponsor, adverts, all that. Yeah, I'm not naked like what Valtteri did. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose there might even be a new helmet design though for you in China next week. Yeah. Home race. Yeah, exactly. I uh, have a new one, special, very special one coming up for already being working on it since December actually. So it's been obviously my idea, the creative side of things. And of course, probably people expect dragon, but there won't be a dragon on the helmet, unfortunately, because I would, I like to be quite, like say, having my own taste of designing stuff. And I expect to be having a lot of driver having dragon gold in their helmet, which that's why I went for complete different direction oh, can't wait to see it no so, Valtteri this time though no 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 there will be everything <laughs> about Shanghai about China about my let's say a little bit of my throwback with this Grand Prix circuit well let's talk about your first home race the Chinese Grand Prix how excited are you yes yeah, so excited to be going back there already of course started quite a lot of preparation with partner events and uh, yes things let's say Melbourne I've been back actually the new Canada works quite well for me just to be able to be going back quite often over the last few well one or two weeks and yeah we'll be get busier already start the busy schedule but uh, I think actually when the weekend start as much as I would hope to be a very normal weekend for me in terms of just feeling you know, not too pressured up, but I think it will be a very special one at the same time. And uh, I think I'll have a lot of goosebumps uh, going into the weekend with all the Chinese fans being there to see their first ever driver coming from their home to be racing the home crowd. So I think as much as I, you know, dream to be racing at the Shanghai circuit, I think also for them to see me, that's going to be a very unique, special moment. Well, what are you looking forward to most? I think... At the moment, I'm looking forward to the most is uh, my first outlap on the track because obviously I never raced in the Shanghai circuit and uh, the, Gr the Grand Prix weekend, I did drove on it uh, in 2019 when there was the last race. I, I did the demonstration in the V8, very old Lotus car, but that lap for me was already feel very special. But then when I have my first outing, lab uh you know as a official driver that's going to be an amazing moment that's what i've been let's aim or dream to be since 2004 when the first race was hosted there so yeah i think that's going to be the the specialist moment at the time can we throw it back to 2019 mm -hmm. because you also did a, a demonstration in the center of shanghai and yeah i mean that was that was mental that was definitely before my barring debut that day was probably my most nervous memorable day 
you know, because uh, yeah, obviously demonstration in the Shanghai, we're not talking about, you know, the near the circuit, the location, which you have a big wider roads, you're right in the center in Xintiandi is where exactly in the city. And uh, yeah, I firstly, I couldn't believe it was happening. And then that was actually before that, I never drove any Formula One cars, only probably did one or two days in this F1 sim, that's about it. And going there with this V8 engine, <laughs> yeah, that was very nervous and also quite a stress, let's say, before I actually, you know, put the helmet on. And once I started my first pop of donuts and I was living the dream by the time, but uh, before then that was... Uh, quite a tension going on and uh, especially for me to looking back to it, I think that was a very special moment was able to you know do several things at the Grand Prix weekend and especially to uh, the special 1000 Grand Prix for F1 so yeah had a good time there but uh, by then I think nobody know who I was only probably the people followed racing closely for my junior uh, career ladder federal series knows me but uh, yeah is a big change compared to now. Well, if that was true, there was an enormous crowd to come and see you then. Yeah, already there was a very crowded yeah. and uh, I mean, it was very packed for the city centre. And then even after that, on Sunday, before the driver's parade, I was able to do two, uh, two laps or one lap, I think, uh, demonstration and one put the helmet off standing just before the starting grid, the whole ground stand the main straight crowd was che cheering on me so i didn't expect that because by then nobody knew who i was to be honest uh, and you've got your own grandstand this year haven't you yeah i do uh, i remember you saying actually before the start of the season <laughs> it sold out in uh in realistic number is 14 minutes but in actual number is four minutes so well, how many how many because the first that? 10 minutes the, the app got crashed due to too many visitors <laughs> so yeah actually it was That's four minutes mad. yeah i was not expecting that but also in the same way like grateful for what's happening and uh, especially having my first ground stand you know after t t t two years and then yeah it's at the main straight so it's opposite of a let's say sauber uh garage which you know is going to be very special for them to be able to see more closely to what's going on in the garage and stuff like that Tell us a little bit more about the Chinese fans. Yeah, I think uh, compared to when we last time there, it's been a life change in terms of the motorsports culture back home. Because I remember my debut in Bahrain, we reached, let's say at the time, the new highest viewership in TV or broadcaster online. So that was a huge boost for people understanding I, you have a countryman racing Formula One. And then a lot of people start following my journey until now and then also a lot of let's say young generations they start go-karts and uh, in back in China also going aboard you know to be taking this specially precise journey I was able to take you know from go-kart F4 F3 hopefully they can gradually you know gain into Formula One world so I think uh, not just in terms of the fan also there's more even the celebrities, you know, famous people back home, they they love or oh, they starting cars, they starting, you know, just to be having fun, racing themselves, do some testing at different tracks, different cars. So I just, for me, to great to see that and uh, great to see the country, let's say, growing and boosting, and uh, because of me, so that just uh, feel very honored and proud moment. And uh, yeah, now of course with so much high technology, people understand so so well the Formula One. You know, world. So t tell us a little bit more about um, the motorsport culture at home now, because you had to leave to go to England at the age of twelve. Is there the infrastructure in China now for for the next you to be able to race at home and make his way, her way up the ladder? If I'm, you know, realistically, I think you still need to take the same way I did, and the only difference are is like it's so clear now which role you have to take in federacies you know going from go-kart and then you go now it's probably the formula regional or whatever championship by then was f4 and then you go f3 f2 but by then for me it was harder just because there was so many different category series so i have to always pick the most let's say professional one the hardest level to be able to compete with the best young drivers but uh, to be honest i would say because we don't have like a manufacturing 
like engine supply, for example, what they have in Japan, Honda. You know, they have this Honda Dream Project, which you have a lot of young drivers they pick and then, you know, put them all the way to F2 and uh, Super Formula and F1. So for us, we still lack a little bit of that, but uh, it's definitely things like that. I definitely hope I can do when I stop racing, finish my own career, try to help as a young generation to be easier to reach or get closer to their dream. But at the, at, at the time right now, I think uh, they still need to go, go abroad, race at the most competitive championship. And that's how you can get an eye from uh, Formula One junior program or teams that maybe can help you for your journey afterwards. This is an advertisement from BetterHelp. If you're a regular listener or watcher of the show, you'll know that I chat to a lot of guests not only about what they do in Formula One, but also their passions outside of it, to find out how they like to relax and make space for themselves in their busy schedules. Taking the time to recharge and look after yourself is one of the best ways to ensure you're in the best position to tackle whatever life throws at you and look after those around you too. After all, you can't pour from an empty cup. It's so easy for us to spread ourselves too thin, trying to keep up with work commitments, family time and our social lives on top. And if you don't manage to get the right balance, you might find your social battery has gone completely flat. If that sounds familiar, you might be interested to know that therapy can give you the self-awareness to build a social life that doesn't drain your battery. Because therapy isn't just for people dealing with major trauma or crises. It's about discovering what makes you happy and making those things a priority. It provides a safe space to explore your values, set boundaries and learn positive coping skills. Therapy empowers you to be the best version of yourself, spend more time focusing on the things you love and unlock the possibilities of a more fulfilling life. With over a thousand therapists in the UK already, BetterHelp can provide access to mental health professionals with a wide variety of expertise in mental health. Our listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash grid. That's better, H-E-L-P dot com slash grid. Let's talk a little bit more about the Grand Prix weekend itself now. Can you give us an idea of what your schedule is going to look like? Is it is it seven in the morning till 11 at night every night or are you going to try and shut out a lot of that noise and keep it as normal as possible actually it would be something like that but uh, we made a very nice let's say adjustment uh, together with the team and also with my own partners so of course of course thankfully for this new schedule as much as how european people might have to travel back i was able to just from Melbourne, I was already in Shanghai before coming to Japan, and after Japan, I'm going straight back there for more. So I'm trying to put everything over the, you know, the the gap between these few races. So when I have start at your Grand Prix, I don't have like a full schedule. I have at least one and a half days like off. But uh, yeah, already after Melbourne, I've been back Monday. So from Tuesday onwards, I had five days conservative. Waking up at 7 a.m., finishing around uh, 7 p.m. Doing what kind of stuff? Just I want you to do, you know, activities, filming, just you know, for different brand activities. It's it's eight hours a day minimum, so it's things like that. And then after Suzuka, we're going back there for more. But that time is a bit more enjoyable because you get meet some fans. You know, you do more activities than just purely, you know, film for for, for different, let's say, merch. Now, look, you mentioned film, and it's a beautiful segue into what I wanted to talk to you about next, which is your documentary. Now, I think a lot of people listening to this, watching this, might not be aware that you've been busy filming. It's called The First One, and the premiere is the week of the Grand Prix. Tell us a little bit more about the documentary. Yeah, I mean, in general, the whole documentary, let's say beginning of the year, we was, you know, we had this footage since I was very young so the people who did the filming group and that they was been following me from from I was like uh, 10 12 years old so this is karting back in Shanghai yeah I was in Sheffield so there's Chinese TV broadcaster TV people being following me back then already so they have a lot of footage from I was young and then yeah this documentary they was recording over the first year and a half and then yeah, before this year, I was like, we were talking about it. Why don't we make a documentary? But the coolest thing about the documentary is that now people from 
mainland China can be watching on the cinema because originally it was maybe planned only for Shanghai or only for maybe online platform because things like Netflix we need assist we need VPN to get there so not everyone can you know watch that and not everyone can understand full English you, you need translation so this is more for let people understand this journey from what I did from a kid to reach this level and also to be understanding a bit more the inside of from one word which for the newcomers I think for them is a, as a huge let's say interest and motivation to be able to watch that film and understand about more what I'm doing in my world and then I think uh, to be hosted or uh, to be out at the Grand Prix week is the is the perfect date for that and so it's a form of inspiration for, for the next generation is that one of the reasons why you've done it yeah exactly it's uh, inspiration for the young generation it's uh, let's say a filming with a lot of insight of Formula One and a lot of what I do of course daily life as well but uh, main focus is about why doing this paddock which a lot of people maybe only see you on TV, you have the TV broadcast, but they don't know what's going on behind. You know, there's a lot of things going up and also growing up as a kid, what I was, you know, able to reach and the world was my dream all the way back in Shanghai and then Sheffield and then going to Maranello, of course, and then back to UK. Uh, it's been a crazy Anstone, journey. It's been in, a crazy journey, Wales, journey so, isn't it? Yeah, so many places I've been to yeah. and... Uh, of course, not all of them are difficult to broadcast that, but all of these are in, you know, details, individual things that uh, people can be, you know, taking a massive interest and influence from that because it's more like how just telling people, you know, if you have a dream, you can try to everything to reach that. It doesn't matter what it takes. Have you enjoyed the filmmaking process? I mean, I obviously doesn't really input a lot this let's say the process of the film but i may mainly just you know have the mic on it's more about catching what i'm doing daily at this paddock and also a little bit outside because this film is not like something we are making up stuff or story it's all real recorded you know life story about my my journey my daily lifestyle looks like so i think that's where this is all about you know i don't want to be fake things up i want to be just just taking people in into this real world and to let them understanding exactly what it looks like to be an F1 driver. What, what do you think will surprise people the most when when they see what your daily life is like? I think in general, like people understand like F1 driver, they are still normal humans, but they have to be training extra hard, you know, for their own success because with how many people in general are fighting for seat you know and especially as a rookie for me coming to that to this paddock every year you have an individual contract and how much attention and how much you have to sacrifice as well is that trying to focus on your job that's where let's say things become difficult i feel the documentary just highlights how far you've come in three years now yeah in formula one and, and the whole fame thing you know, let's take this year as an example. You've already been on the front covers of L Men, Wall Street Journal, GQ Sports. Have I missed? Yeah. I probably missed some stuff as well. But it seems you're getting an awful lot of traction now off track. Does it feel a bit surreal? Yeah, I mean, at the very beginning, like you're feeling okay the first time. You know, a magazine or some famous I don't know, newspaper or people, journalists or interview. You feel really, you know, crazy about am I actually in the you know in the magazine cover and now like you're getting so many daily requests from all this big big brand which you have to pick from what's works out the best with you know with the situation you are in and what you want the the whole readers to see so yeah I feel different surreal and also in another way I think uh, it feels good even though there's actual work to be you know going on for this scenes filming you know going on uh, during my break because most of them are done over summer or winter break when I'm back home mm. but uh, in another way I think it's a great way for me to promote myself and uh, for people to understanding you know they have a F1 driver because I think Formula 1 is growing a lot but uh, five years ago or even six years ago back home nobody exactly know what 
you know a, a real F1 driver looks like, and it is. You know, even the sport itself, at, uh, back in the day, it was difficult for people to understanding that without having their own home drivers, let's say. So we got all these front covers. You know, like when we go to Mexico, Checo Perez is on every billboard, isn't he? When we get to Shanghai next week, is there just going to be Joe everywhere, everywhere we look? Yeah, it will be a lot. There will be a lot. <laughs> uh, I can't promise everywhere because Shanghai is the biggest city. Sure, sure <laughs> but, that is uh, true. There will be, I think, there will be at the airport, underground, bus station, all the bridge. Mm. You know, there will be a sign. And uh, also, even in the building, you know, the if you've been to the Bond, the... Normally, there's a building with like a graphics, like I love Shanghai, but then that will be a picture of the Grand Prix post. So awesome. there'll be a lot going on. Uh, yeah, I can't wait. It will be quite strange seeing myself everywhere. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I think after that weekend will be quite chaotic. Do you enjoy the photo shoots? Because you're doing a lot of them now. <laughs> to be honest, if I'm honest, I prefer less because the problem, like I don't mind doing photo shoot, but because with the busy schedule you have already at least as a driver, that uh, you're traveling so much stuff, like, like I mentioned, all these are done, or most of them, back home, where normal, as a driver going on vacations, and I have to be, you know, stay there for a whole day, you know, more than, around more than eight hours for doing all this extra work, of course, that's something probably sometimes get a little bit too much for you, but uh, at the other time, I think, if you are this level of uh, of let's say motorsports, you have to you know do things like that to to make yourself better and also to make people aware what's go what's going on. And and if I was to say to you, tell me about your interests away from the racetrack. Is fashion one of them now? Yes, yeah, always been one of them. Always been there. Yes, yeah, things. Uh, well, the trainers, right? You've got. <laughs> have you still got? Have you still got hundreds set, of pairs? So I have a lot of pairs, but uh, yeah, a lot of pairs, of course. Some of them I can't wear with different partnerships going on, but uh, I do like to uh, collect them and uh, a lot of pairs that uh, I haven't been worn them and I will never wear them because they look like art piece. But in the same time, I love designing stuff. I love, love let's say, wear clothes that uh, designed or have a very high influence by yourself. And also, let's say, the helmet. Uh, you know, most of them I draw on a plain helmet graphics sent to the helmet designer and he put everything together so I feel like I'm uh, taking a big part of that because that's where my interests are. And, and do you put a lot of effort into what you wear to a racetrack on the Thursday? Probably a lot less than what people expect <laughs> because I think it's it's already inside my kind of DNA so I just feel like okay I'm going to wear that daily and then yeah I just put that on the track because things I pick I don't have uh, let's say a close set who like pick the clothes for me or give me a few outfits to to pick from everything is done indi individual by myself and uh, yeah I feel like what I want to wear at the track is what I would wear a daily life and then for the fans you know if they they're happy or they want to have something similar they can actually you know go buy it and wear themselves similar way but I don't want something that maybe it's just for the fashion fashion week because then it's probably it's not the, the real me what I'm doing and I feel like just to be yourself expert yourself and that's perfect way to do it in Formula 1 platform I love the arty side of you designing your own helmets and things is, is that something that you learned at school were you an art student or is it something yeah, you just learned yourself I, I picked the art it was straight away you know art PE was my first first to pick mm. and then and then the rest I kind of add them together what's mm. was better for me mm. So art was always uh, something I loved since a kid. Well, it's great to see that you are using your position to promote racing and Formula One within China. And I did also want to ask you about other stuff you're doing away from the track. And the Special Olympics, in particular, last year in Berlin, uh, you went there. Just tell us about that experience and what you took from it. That was a very, let's say, a different experience because... Uh, I've been, you know, following up quite closely with the Special Olympics and uh, wanted to be, you know, ambassador for them in terms of just to share them with my own experience because I feel like a lot of athletes in Special Olympics, they still have their own dreams that they want to achieve, but so with, you know, certain disabilities that, uh, you know, they're not able to achieve some of the, 
you know, the stuff they want it to be, but they're still there trying to compete against their own, let's say, ranked level. And I want to share my own experience, also my own, let's say, the way all the hard times it built up from me as a kid having no, let's say, somebody to chase for or let's say ex Formula One driver I can look up to and everything is figured out by myself and my family and the team. So yeah, we we try to share together and also taking them to Formula One race weekend and we took six less athletes on Silverstone last year and they yeah, they almost cried and that for me it's just a really warm hard moment for me to use my ambassador role just to give them, you know, a tour what it looks like and having a best day of their life and I think it's good and uh, yeah continue will support this uh, Special Olympics let's say series and hopefully that I can you know give the kids this energy they needed for their own life need, needs so it's an incredible story I remember you bringing them to, to Silverstone yeah lots of happy faces I knew there was so many people was uh, was a massive Formula One fan, so I think uh, yeah, they they definitely enjoy that, and mm -hmm. I think uh, it's great for me just to share a bit of uh, the inside my story to them together as well. Give them this the en extra energy they needed for whatever they're doing for their future lives. Your story is so inspiring. When we go back to the documentary, does it have English subtitles? Yeah, it does. So, so we can, so we can watch. You them. can watch no, it. <laughs> no, but just I think you know, so many people could learn from your experiences as you say it it's actually phenomenal yeah. what you and your family went through you know moving to the other side of the world having no history of racing in your family negotiating all the potholes yeah exactly i mean do you ever stop and reflect about that it's difficult for me to reflect right now but like i did reflect like let's say that day when i signed the contract or when i had a phone call from my manager green you know and together with Mark, that uh, you could have a race seat in 2022 season. And then, uh, you know, a kid like me, like I've been through a lot of stuff and uh, I always start crying. Like, I think I never cried before that for four or five years, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I was like, yeah, it was just, uh, for me, it was just something that I dreamed of. Mm -hmm. And I feel like even when I was in F2, at the time, halfway through the season, I was leading the championship, but I still felt like the percentage I get to Formula One was less than 5% because that year was kind of a tough year. There was only one seat at the time Alfa Romeo was available and there was started, I think, was almost 10 driver fighting and the list going down and down. Of course, I was still always in the list, but yeah, I didn't really could believe that uh, you know I would have this opportunity at least for that year to be going straight from F2 into F1. Now can we talk about Silverstone 2022 because that's happened since you were last on the show. Yep. It was obviously your horrendous crash at the start. How do you reflect on that everything that went on in those first 10 seconds of the race? That was scary. Uh, that was probably the most scared I've been. Uh, driving a race car and uh, everything was happening so quick. I think the the worst thing about the whole situation was that before that I was in a such a great form that I had like you know Q3 points, very good times. After you know the the trouble with the reliability before that, so finally things is coming to me, and then with a very unexpected uh, instant before turn one, and then yeah the crash was uh, everything was happening so quickly and. But, you know, when I was upset down with that speed, still very grateful to be walking off with only a few, you know, uh, small injuries and, uh, yeah, no broken bones. I, I don't know how it happened, but it just shows how safety really improved over the years. And, uh, of course, Halo, it was uh, the main factor saved my life at that day in Silverstone. Have you discussed it with mum and dad? Uh, not the inside feeling, no because I don't want them to be to be feeling, you know, uh, let's say nervous about it. And uh, of course, I just told them that uh, I was okay. But the worst thing about that, it was like the first race when my whole family was watching. So my dad, my mom, my sister, for the whole race, first race of the year, they was all together because of course, I always lived in UK and uh, Silverstone is kind of my second home race. So yeah, for them to be to be there, I think it was not a nice moment. Can you imagine how 
nervous of how they felt at the time before you know the chap gave them the green did what happened that day change your approach in any way i mean it only changed my approach for the following race because i remember being back to back to back races coming up I had no time to be, of course, firstly reflect on that. But all I wanted to do in Austria was try to, you know, make safe lap one. Try to compete lap one and then I was free because I want to get that over my head. So, yeah, I think definitely changed a little bit. But I think it's more the form, you know, the whole car was destroyed. We have to put, introduce a new chassis. Everything was new and there was obviously a little bit adapting. I just needed so I wasn't able to have continue the form I was able to left off before the starting of that Sunday Grand Prix so that was a little bit of course not the best way of that but uh, besides from that I don't feel there was only mental issues everything was fine so well and, and let's take a positive is that you know the roll hoops are now stronger as a direct result of what we saw happen that day yeah exactly I think uh, you know things always always changing after mm. a big incident like that mm. but uh, I think I'm happy, firstly, how FI introduced Halo. I think it not just saved my life that day. It saved many people's life, even I think Grosjean, all these other F2, you know, there was a lot of cars landing on top of each other. I think that's, let's say, the, the biggest in, improved or in, uh, improvement in safety. And then, of course, with the Road Hope, uh, FI decided to be making this adjustment very soon in one year time so i think things are improving this episode is brought to you by bitdefender the official cybersecurity partner of ferrari in cybersecurity and formula one every millisecond counts only the most advanced cars and dedicated teamwork win races on the track and only the most advanced security technology and elite specialists have the power to prevent defend and stop cyber attacks Technology makes all the difference in who has a clear advantage, where Bitdefender is renowned for driving leading-edge innovation in cybersecurity. Bitdefender helps safeguard the data of Ferrari. They supercharge the cybersecurity team's ability to swiftly identify and respond to any threat that arises. Bitdefender has earned the trust of Ferrari for its commitment to innovation and for being at the forefront of cybersecurity to manage continuous and evolving challenges. So join the millions of consumers and businesses that trust Bitdefender to protect their digital worlds. Visit bitdefender.com to learn more about why Ferrari chose Bitdefender to stay ahead of cyber threats and how you can make your digital life safer. Let's talk about performance now. Um, how would you sum up your opening two seasons in Formula One? Three points finishes in year one, three points finishes in year two. How do you feel things have gone from your point of view inside the cockpit? Uh, it's been, let's say, a lot of, of course, there was highs and lows, but uh, a lot of moments are very frustrating from my side. Of course, uh, I think year one, if there was no issues on the reliability, that would be still probably my highest points f scoring of the ch championship over the two years, which, you know, then it, last year I probably will be, you know, even more frustrated. Mm -hmm. But yeah, first year, I think the car was super great. Of course, shame about the reliability. I had uh, three in a row DNFs, two of them was in the points. And then last year, I feel like uh, for me as a driver doing a step, but still it wasn't enough let's say in terms of inverted that into uh, results on the standings just because I think as a team improved bigger than what we did and then we was able to only fighting for P9, P10 so when we score points it's, it's almost like you know you need a perfect weekend to score in points and then the gap is definitely getting bigger like I think everyone expected the top teams they open in the gap and then the midfield battle is tight but uh, there's too much or let's say as a gap or space between the top five teams than the other five so that's probably the tough time in formula one but then yeah you quickly realize that and but you have to be consistent you have to be on there on your form every single individual year so i think consistency is where i still missed a bit last season well can i talk to you about two races in particular last year then we'll bring it on yep. to this year but let's start with hungary 
Both you and Valtteri are on fire. You qualify P5. I think he's P7. Where did that performance come from? Because it felt like a bolt out of the blue at the time. Just yeah. what lit up the car that weekend? Honestly, it's a very good question. <laughs> so if I'm honest, even for us as a team, you know, going from the race before into that race, we didn't change something massively. We have this own baseline setup. But when the car was on ground, it was turning. You know, it was sitting on the ground very nicely, feeling the downforce, the load you needed. And I feel like that week we were being top 10 every single practice session and then qualify, we just maximize everything. It just shows you how, in a way, important Formula 1 is for the car. You know, if you have the car, drivers all can develop into results, you know. And then, yeah, that was a perfect Saturday to show people that, you know, if everything is there, I can be, you know, as fast as all, all these, you know, Grand Prix winner, drivers like Valtteri is such a great one lap especially pace driver so for me to be I'll qualify him starting P5 I think it also uh, was also probably the best of the Ferrari engines and <laughs> I was just surprised and also in a way give me a big confidence going into the coming season so that was Do a good know, moment and the biggest irony of it all is that it meant that you were right in the melee <laughs> at the start the one race where you could have done being further back was probably that one yeah I mean uh, it was a tough, that Hungary, it was a, a very mixed feeling because I had a perfect Saturday and Sunday, like it was like the worst day of my life because that feeling was worse than maybe P10, you know, and then you have a reability issue because I was out of the control already before the lights go off. My engine kicks in this all too safe mode which switch off all my refs before the start and i had nothing to do i have to standing still you know do a whole procedure which was too late for the original start and then yeah you i was last before even the lights crossed the you know the green light so yeah things like that i think i had a lot of moments in formula one a lot of frustrations but uh i'm just grateful to be still here still can have time to pull myself and still can you know continue to be work hard and develop some results do you think this year's car will be as quick in hungary has it got the same characteristics uh this year's car is completely different uh we need to see which race we're going to be you know very strong at because we have what was good is that we have quite a lot of strong car, uh, development let's say new upgrades coming up but uh, in terms of is it going to be as good in hungary it's uh it's a question mark for now because okay. even though at the time we didn't expect last year's car to be that good it's a short at the Hungarian race so even in quali so I'm just hope that uh, we can continue to make make these steps because uh, you see a lot of other teams we are fighting for they are closing quite a lot the gap so we need to take action but obviously this year the priority is the pit stop so we need to solve that and uh, we can race Look, we'll come on to that but if, if if hungary last year was a brilliant saturday and a really frustrating sunday can we now talk about qatar yeah. which is kind of the opposite wasn't it <laughs> yes yeah, <it's really laughs> um, last last p9 would you say that's the best drive you've put in so far in your career i'd probably say yeah this one was definitely up there uh, I think uh, in terms of the best drive is either that one or I did felt the one I did in, in Bahrain this year was pretty one of the also up there. Of course, the result didn't came just because the top five team, nobody, there was no retirement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, these two is definitely up there. And uh, yeah, it was, uh, I think Qatar is probably on top of the list just because the, the certain stance we had in the weather, the temperature we have to face for the race. I think uh, for me, obviously the results feel like all this hard work, this pain I went through in the race, it got rewarded. So I was quite happy, of course. And uh, it was something not expected because I think at some stage I was defending a Red Bull and that's where it makes the difference with Sergio because I think, and then he had this penalty track limit and I was able to jump in with the on track on the with the penalty so yeah things like that it just you know helping and I feel like as a normal certain stand I will never defend for a Red Bull but then you know at this stage at some point I feel like I had a similar pace and uh, of course I'm, I'm going to try my best to maintain the position and now that race proved just how spot on your race pace is 
I did want to ask you a little bit more about Quali because something technical director James Key said earlier in the year was Joe's race pace, absolutely happy with that. We'd like to see a little bit more consistency on a Saturday. How do you set about doing that? I think it's also something for me as a key to be improved for this season because I think uh, obviously my benchmark, Valtteri, everyone knows how good he is with one lap pace especially. And uh, for me, at the first year, it was not easy to catch him. And then last year, this year, I had quite a lot of occasions to be better. But for me, I do felt a lot of times I could be quicker than him. But then with that little mistake there or over pushing, it makes me, you know, makes a little bit worse on the static, statics. So, yeah, uh, definitely something I want to improve that. And I feel like in qualifiers at some stage, I always try to give it everything, every single corner. But at some stage, you have to sacrifice a little bit to be making a clean exit to not having the mistake. And that's something I want to clean off a little bit. But Joe, it, it's, it seems to be happening up and down the grid. Just look at Lando Norris, brilliantly fast racing driver. But we did last year see him make a few mistakes in qualifying. I, several occasions, I remember him coming into a post-qualifying press conference and saying, I should have been on pole. But it was, I remember track limits in Qatar, funnily enough, was one of the examples yeah. he gave. So does it come down to experience about knowing where to hold back? Yeah, I mean, I think the hard part about like where we are as a team is that in Q1, we need to give it everything already. So that's where the mistake could be happen. But like Valtteri, for sure, he's, you know, having less than what I do. And then, of course, when we reach Q2, then it's a little bit easier because you already have this uh, pre-attempt on your flying lap. And also, you know that Q2, you're either going to you know, give it a maximum out or this is going to be the position we're going to be standing for. So, And then Q1 with the field now within a second cover, you know, all the all the people. So I think that's where mistake can be happen. And that's where like where we are standing for that uh, we need to give everything. But I think it's a finding a great balance between how much you can push in certain corners than mm. your previous lap, you know? Mm. So that's these things I think can still, for me to improve. And uh, I think I will make a step and uh, yeah, hopefully I can have a clean weekend this time out. And uh, yeah. I remember you saying when you first came on Beyond the Grid that Valtteri was a different teammate because actually you did not only share data, but he actually tried to help you a bit. As you've got closer to him and started to beat him, is he still as generous as he, as he was two years ago? Of course, it's uh, always quite a competition in the team. Of uh, You know, you want to be the best at, in the team. That's that's clear for, you know, your own personal future career. And I think it's the same for everyone. But what I do say for him is that uh, he is still there, you know, to share information, to be able to make a step together with me together, try to improve it as a team improve our package all, all, all the way around. And uh, definitely, let's say, the first year compared to now is a bit more intense. Mm -hmm. So we need to, you know, always fighting a bit more on, on track. But so we always, you know, do the right thing and uh, whoever can perform can come on top. So there's no, let's say, too clever or eager feeling between any of us, even in the race craft, you know, if one guy's ahead, the other guy we're trying to use him to protect a little bit or help his race if you know we're only fighting for the final spot so yeah so a like bit that. like we saw the Haas guys doing in Saudi Arabia we you you would work for each other in the same way yeah I don't think any of us can be ex extremist magnets <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that I was a, <laughs> was it 12 seconds in 18 laps or so I think he, he uh, gained yeah but also I think I don't know he had 20 seconds penalty uh, and, so. and 20 yeah 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 true oh, obviously true. yeah I think uh, things like that Definitely people are looking into that a little bit. But uh, yeah, we definitely are working still as a team. And uh, of course, I think this year for all the drivers on the grid with the contract expire and everybody want to show their own potential. Everybody want to be the best of themselves and for whatever reason for their career. So I think, uh, yeah, we do want to be each other. We want to be best in our team. But uh, let's, you know, we're still a team player in the same way. As you say, as we speak now, 13 drivers are going to be out of contract at the end of the year. Do you enjoy 
the driver musical chairs? Or uh, would you just like to get it sorted and know what you do? Yeah, I definitely prefer to be getting it sorted and uh, knowing, you know, what I'm doing for the next few years so I can be, you know, fully committed to the program, to the project going ahead with, you know, with any team. So for me, I think, uh, of course, I know it's a rookie coming into Formula 1. It's not like lo uh, maybe 10 years ago, a new driver coming to Formula 1, they always have like a, a long or two, three years contract. Now it's like the team wants to see a individual contract, want to see you perform. And then, yeah, I feel like uh, having individual yearly contract is, is tough for mental side because you want to limit it, your mistake in the same time you want to be sure your passion of uh, progression as a driver to the team. So that's where the hard thing comes because summertime, September, you're still not sure exactly, you know, your contract when they can give you the green, when you're going to sign. That's where... Those things come very tricky for the drivers in the cockpit. I feel like I'm talking to Valtteri Bottas because I remember him saying when he was at Mercedes, when it was just a drip fed, one year extension, one year extension. And then suddenly he went to Alfa Romeo and got a long term deal. He, I remember him saying what a difference it made to his approach, knowing what he was doing, not just for next year, but the year after. Ditto, ditto Carlos Sainz actually at Ferrari. Yeah, exactly. I think obviously with Carlos, it's a little bit of a different situation. Like, uh, he will have a seat but like he's trying to find the best situation of course it's not nice when you know you start the season already knowing that you're not going to drive for Ferrari next year but I think he can use this year to prove himself which he already did in Australia so yeah for me of course I have this feeling of Valtteri felt in his entire public career until he left Mercedes mm -hmm. but uh, yeah in a way that uh, at some stage it's uh, difficult to find this balance between the, them because you don't really know where exactly you will end up when you're going to make, make the signed contract and how many years it's going to be your next, uh, let's say, black-white paper. So that's all, yeah, something you try to not think about over the season, but at some stage, you are also, you know, aware of the situation, knowing exactly you need to perform, you need to show what they can do. And, uh, yeah, finding, let's say, the right approach into every weekend. Uh, that's uh, probably the biggest challenge for the drivers, especially I think this year with the with so many drivers out of contract, it's going to be all rumours going on. Uh, and with so many seats available, are you looking everywhere or is, is your priority to stay where you are? I mean, priority, of course, is I would love to be, you know, staying here and to the Audi. But I think uh, what I do say is the already before, I'm looking definitely for, let's say, hopefully a longer contract. And uh, I'm quite open to, of course, all the team. But uh, at the moment, I'm very committed to the season that uh, we are facing together with uh, Stake F1 team. Try to finish the season in a high, try to pull myself, try to show the, the people or the engineers that uh, I'm continuing to grow, continue to making further steps as a driver. And then we see the rest. But uh, yeah, for me, definitely, I would think what's the best for myself together and for my future, of course, the main object is to continue staying for Formula 1 in this paddock. And then, yeah, if you have several different options, then you can have a bit more deeper look into that. And do you have the car? Let's talk about the C44. Do you have the car to show the world what you can do? I think we can, but of course, what I'm talking about, we can. We're not talking about fighting for podium, you know, fighting for top five. We're talking about fighting for these final spots in, in the points in the final top 10s. I think, uh, you know, if I can perform every single weekend like I did in Bahrain, I think that will, you know, give me a very high high chance of uh, having something, a good or longer contract together with, uh, yeah, even with my team or even with other options. So this time I just want to uh, clean up a little bit and try to be there, be consistent, give the trust of myself that, uh, you know, I can be as good as all of them and show the other people what I can do and what about these pit stop problems ah. yeah it's a it's a tough frustration uh, let's say issues we're having we're suffering as a driver it's probably not the most let's say coolest thing to have when you knowing that even though now we're in race 4 we have 100% solved the issue we are making our way through the problem we're changing adjusting try to play with several different things upgrading of our materials also the wheel nut gun all this stuff 
to be you know back in form at least to be consistently not having this you know 30 seconds 50 second stops but it's tough because if i look back to the races we've been through Bahrain was p11 so jeda i would be 11 because of thanks for kevin so i would become all right behind or five seconds behind hulkenberg it's not a bad result in terms of how our race craft or the car is but yeah when you come to a stop you just constantly worry about the front <laughs> Will not. So that's something it's, it's tough to go through. But uh, the whole issue will be solved later on, on the other races. Unfortunately, it's the fact. Well, we look forward to that. We're looking forward to racing in China again. Thank can you. you. Can you just imagine for a second if you got your first points of the season at home? I would love to be scoring points in Shanghai. So it would be huge, yeah, wouldn't it? Having a great result there is going to be... A huge moment for me also for my entire career and uh, yeah to be racing home for the first time in my you know f1 season and also my first time racing at the track and it's going to be very a memorable let's see weekend afterwards but so uh, yeah let's focus on obviously to prepare the best possible give fan a great great show we're all really looking forward to it. new for this year joe uh we have some quick fire questions to end yep. Okay. All right. Are you ready? Yeah. First one. What else are you good at? Uh, football, badminton. Can you name one of them? Football or badminton? I would say badminton because my football rank is alright for Chinese player. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe Europeans a little bit lower. I'm, I'm quite good. Now, which racing driver, dead or alive, would you like to be stuck in a lift with? Uh, maybe Sebastian Vettel. I think he's a very intelligent guy. He'll get you out. He knows tech technical <laughs> stuff about everything in the world so. uh who would play you in a film uh i'll, well, I'll go for alonso are you mean driver so no just ah, anyone. Uh, everyone yeah no but alonso ah. i'm interested yeah no if everyone alonso is not my first pick so. <laughs> okay <laughs> sorry but i will go for the ray johnson the rock Cool. Not the size. Size is different, but I, yeah, think you I just love him as an actor. <laughs> he wouldn't get in the character. car, would he? <laughs> No. Uh, who is the coolest person in your contacts? Uh, for me, it's uh, J. Cho or JJ. So the two Chinese celebrities, and they are like one of the biggest two famous singer of all time. So Are they going to be coming to China? J. Cho was in the Australia Grand Prix. JJ is going to be coming to the to the race in Shanghai. Awesome. Look, final one. Who would be your first guest if you hosted a podcast? I would go for Daniel Rick. Because I do think he's a very funny guy and the broadcaster you want to be. People can say stuff that they wanted and having cool stories. I think Daniel has a lot, so... Do you hang out with him quite a lot? Or? Yeah, I mean, I do hang out with him quite a bit. But of course, mm. uh, I mean, I'm not living in Monaco. But mm. uh, when I had the chance, I always try to you know, speak to him. Mm. He's good fun, isn't he? Yeah, exactly. All right. Joe, thank you very much. Great to have you on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers.